Hey everyone, welcome back to our channel. We continue our journey into data science, data engineering, and data factory at Microsoft Fabric. In this episode, we have a privilege of hosting Abhishek. To kick things off, Abhishek, could you introduce yourself and share how we are shaping the future in data factory area? Absolutely. Thank you, Esther, for inviting me into this uh, beautiful talk. Um, so I'm Abhishek, and I work as a product manager in the Data Factory team in Microsoft Fabric. And I'm here to talk about Medallion architecture and data ingestion um, into the Medallion architecture in Microsoft Fabric. Fantastic. So let's start with the details and the brief introduction. So could you explain the concept of bronze, of silver, of gold ingestion patterns, layers? Those uh, concepts are well known, but how those layers, and those names are related to Fabric Lake House? Absolutely. And so these are patterns um, in the data engineering world. Uh, where, especially in the lake house architecture, in the era of lake house, where um, people have uh, quite distinguished ways of storing the data, uh, and especially with lake house, it gives you infinite uh, scale in terms of what data you would want to store. Uh, you can start creating these architectures to keep your data and scale your data engineering process. And so the whole idea is to kind of distribute your data into three different zones, bronze, silver, and gold. And by these names, as you would understand, bronze is the layer where you get started with, where you put your raw data in the original data formats. So let's say if you have uh, CSVs, you have uh, you know ORCs, you have uh, whatnot, even the binary data sets that you have, you may want to ingest those into a bronze zone. Uh, and these are you know, do not, may not have well-defined schema at this point in time. Uh, these could be binary data as well, uh, like images and things like that. And so you start with storing them into the bronze zone. And you know that this is, at this point in time, this is not con consumable or not ready for consumption uh, into your reporting layer, right? And then you start enhancing this data or enriching this data and moving this data into the silver zone. Um, this could be done via various tools that we have in Microsoft Fabric. Uh, you have pipelines to operationalize and ingest data, which we'll see in this talk. And then you have notebooks where you can write code in Spark SQL. And then you can transform or enrich that data. You can also do ingestion via notebooks. And then once the data is ready, which is cleansed, which is standardized, where you have well-defined structure to it, this is where you store it in the silver zone. And then comes the final thing, which is the, uh, the gold zone. Many customers use silver zone, but then the gold zone is where it is the final curated data that you have. Think of it as if you're joining data, if you're doing things like uh, joining data across multiple uh, you know, tables, dimensions, and facts, and then you're kind of getting into a final state of the data, which is ready for consumption via reports or even by data science team for their ML learning model and so on. And so that is where you have this concept of a gold or a curated zone. Now, when you're implementing this, think of it as you can use different lake houses in fabric. You can create absolutely different lake house by the name of bronze, silver, gold. Many customers can, you know, they, they can end up using the same lake house as well. Uh, within you know different zones so it's it's a pattern uh, and so we do suggest using you know you can use absolutely three different lake house for these three different zones so abhishek just to recap it's a design pattern the medallion architecture is named because those are the colors of medals mm -hmm. and some customers can use different lake house or the same lake house i would like to follow up on the question can I use or should I use different workspaces? Absolutely. So that's a great question. Now, the, the concept of workspaces uh, comes in um, where you have to segregate work. Like think of it as that is the segregation when you're creating notebooks for what we see customers doing is they create a workspace for a given project. But of course, you can have workspaces 
created for different environments as well and i would consider these zones as different environments like the bronze the silver and the gold and they will have different use cases on which users are acting on these three different zones and hence it does qualify in case if you want to have them across workspaces uh, it gives you another security guardrail on like workspace has its own role-based access control. So if you want to have an additional layer of control on who gets access to these zones or layers, it makes complete sense to kind of even make use of workspaces. Got it. So this design pattern requires keeping the three layers, it, at minimum three layers. That is right. Okay, so let's continue uh, with, with the next question. I would like to ask you about the key strategies that are involved when we are ingesting the data into the, the first stage, the initial stage, the bronze stage. Yeah, that is extremely important. And so few of the learnings that I have is when you're ingesting data into bronze, uh, make sure you don't overcomplicate it. What I mean by overcomplicating it is don't worry about uh, getting the right schema uh, or getting about, you know, doing the right transformations or cleansing at that point in time. The whole idea over here is to get the data as is, as much as possible, uh, and then keep it in your bronze layer. It's kind of POR, point of record, uh, you know, for, for your data. And so keep the data as raw as it can. And, and that's a great learning uh, that I have had with different customers is keep it, for example, if you're copying data from ADLS, Gen2 or Amazon S3, like any of these file storages, when you're loading via pipelines, it gives you an option of ingest binary data, which means it'll not consider the schema it's not going to make change in that schema and it's going to copy those files as is. And that is kind of keeping the file as raw as possible without touching the actual data set. And that's what is expected at this phase of ingestion. And at the same time, you can imagine that the size of the bronze probably would be larger, if not equal, it, it mostly will be larger than the size of silver and gold. And the reason is that you have the raw data uh, and when the data is raw, it's uh, uncompressed, it may be compressed or uncompressed. It can have a lot of columns which are not needed, uh, which is not a bad thing at all because when you're doing analytics, the more data you have, more columns you have, the merrier it is, right? So all the data should be captured in bronze, number one. One. Number two, performance is an important criteria that you need to keep track of because your sizes, as you know, is large, uh, what you're ingesting in, into bronze. And hence, there needs to be a perf and, and a scale guidance used there as well. And so we'll talk about that during this session later on, of course, but um, performance is the key criteria over here uh, while ingesting it, uh, keeping the data raw. These are kind of two things which I would keep in top of my head. Fantastic. The last question before digging into the details and the demo, could you comment as some customers uh, have the, the worry that because they proceed with those three layers, they duplicate the data essentially. Can you comment that? Oh, absolutely. So um, duplication of data uh, can add a lot of cost. It can also add a lot of management headache because you have like multiple versions of the data. And especially when it comes to uh, data which is stored in the same region uh, or in the same lake house, there doesn't make sense to kind of duplicate such data points. And this is where shortcuts are extremely useful when it comes to your bronze data sources. And think of it as if your data resides in Azure Blob Storage within the same region. And I'll talk about why I'm talking about this word called region So, so and stressing on it. Um, so if it's in the same region, you absolutely don't need to duplicate the data sets across in multiple copies uh, because it adds not much value. Uh, because all you're doing is you're referencing them as a source and you're not modifying this layer. Uh, think of bronze as where you're kind of ingesting data and then leaving the data to be processed and then written into silver. So you're not going to go back into bronze and then update the data sets. No. And hence, it completely makes sense to have these beautiful capabilities in Fabric, like shortcuts, which can access those data sets 
and it can directly access it without ingesting it or physically moving that data into the bronze zone. While it still feels that it is inside bronze, you see the shortcuts option over there. You can actually access it via notebooks, Spark SQL, and so on. So it's, it's awesome. It feels absolutely the data sits there, but in reality, it is a shortcut or a reference to that data, which is sitting in, in ADLS Gen 2. And so imagine that if you're three teams working on the same data sets, you don't need to have have three copies of that data set rather uh, you would um, have a single copy and use a shortcut to kind of access those data sets so that's a beautiful thing in fabric uh, that helps you with uh, with that it helps you save cost it helps you save time it helps you save management efforts in terms of managing uh, ingestion process which needs to incrementally load data and things like that for for those data sources which you don't really need to have multiple clones or copies of it makes sense so how does the data pipeline so data factory data pipeline within microsoft fabric facilitate the process of the data ingestion why it's critical for the every data engineer and what are the benefits absolutely so uh, i'll talk about two benefits for now and let's start with dig into the demo as well uh, with this so here i am on a pipeline and so what I'll, I'll do is I'll, I'll do a few things here I'll start off with an ingestion pipeline which basically incrementally loads data and this is this is these are scenarios where you're not using a shortcut and there could be multiple reasons for that for example shortcuts may not be available for uh, operational database right and sometimes you know that operational databases using a shortcut or something uh, even if if that exists may not be a good idea because you don't want to overload those operational databases and so we have another set of toolings in terms of replication uh, available in fabric which are awesome tools to kind of replicate that data but what i would talk about pipelines is it gives you control flow it is visual in nature and so you, as a data engineer you can focus on writing sql or writing notebooks uh, you know python uh, spark sql and and let the orchestration work uh, which is more visual in terms of how the flow of your data processes are happening is what is defined in the pipeline and pipeline gives you resilience and things like that it lets you build an item potent data uh, operational process item potency is extremely important as a data engineering person because when you define a certain job like a stored procedure or a notebook or a sql script you should define it in a way that it doesn't corrupt your data right so every time you run it you should be able to recover the data you should be able to run it and get it to the same state even if you're doing n runs with the same parameters right that is more about item potency but i keep stressing on this because it's extremely important for a data engineer when you're building these resilient data pipelines you have item potency you have start from failure and things like that so pipelines gives you those capabilities of restarting your pipeline from the point of failure so that you don't have to go back and run your whole notebook all over and over again in case of failures and you can start from the point where it failed and things like that so those are one of the benefits the second benefit which i want to show here is the data ingestion capability and you can ingest large data sets uh, for example i have a pipeline here uh, and i have a activity called copy activity you can access all the activities through the activity canvas here and you will see a bunch of these activities and, and a lot more that we are adding on a regular basis um, and so uh, apart from those activities we have the copy data activity which can be easily configured you can even use a copy wizard experience and it's known as copy assistant uh, and this gives you this beautiful experience where you can click on what data sets you want an example is uh, let's load the nyc taxi green data right uh, it's 2gb in size it's a sample data set and the idea of sample data set of course is to kind of play around if you're playing around with fabric you can use this in real world scenario you would go down here uh, create a data source to your data right it could be on amazon s3 it could be on blob it could be postgresql it could be any data source the benefit of using pipelines is you get 100 plus data source connectors and a lot more coming in the future for example right now you see a bunch of 50 connectors but uh, we have dataflow gen 2 as well which offers 170 plus connectors and pipelines would support those 170 connectors in the future in the near future as well 
Now, on top of that, we do have different runtimes, like you can use on-premise data gateway or enterprise data gateway to load or ingest data from on-premise source. You can set up, that's like a client that gives you access to data sources which are not visible or are line of sight from the cloud directly. And it could be protected data, it could be data behind VNet, it could be a data uh, sitting in on-premise enterprise environment or network environment. And so to access such data, we do have concept of on-premise data gateway or enterprise data gateway, which is an installer. Uh, once you install that via that gateway, you would be able to access your on-premise data sources. It could be HDFS on-premise. It could be a SQL Server on-premise and ingest data. So these are the benefits you get using pipelines. At this point in time, when we're talking, we are running a preview right now or a private preview for uh, ingesting data via the on-premise data gateway. It's not publicly available, but it'll be available publicly very soon, probably when this video goes out, maybe already publicly available. So that's about the ingestion capabilities. You get managed connectors, and that's extremely important because when you are ingesting data, even in raw, what you expect is scale. You expect no security issues with the, with the connectors that you're using, a lot of open source data sources like PostgreSQL and so on. Uh, and, and so the moment you start using your custom or, or custom drivers, uh, you have to take the ownership of managing them. There are security concerns, there are patches, and a lot of things goes on in the open source world. Now, with the managed set of connectors that you get with pipelines and Dataflow Gen 2 is that these are scrutinized by Microsoft security, make sure that these are managed connectors, it matches the performance bar, uh, you, can, you can extract data at the highest possible rates. And so those are the things that we have already taken care of. And so this is the second uh, thing, apart from operationalization and, and the control flow that uh, pipelines gives you, it gives you a data ingestion capability, which we will use to ingest data into bronze. Let's go to the pipeline where I was loading data and, and I want to show here in this pipeline what I'm doing is I'm doing an incremental data load. While it may sound complex, this is the real world data engineering requirement. I want to do load data uh, from various sources A, B, C, D and I only want to load incrementals. Uh, in a sense, only the newly created data sources or data records is what I want to copy rather than copying all the thing, all the time. Because taking the full copy into the raw zone means you have PBs of data and you're copying PBs of data in every run, which is which is not practical at all. So coming back to this um, scenario is where we have to ingest data into raw and then into raw or bronze, and then we will do it via the copy activity. I do have a few activities above it, uh, and the idea is, you know, we are doing some kind of watermarking. Uh, watermarking is again a data engineering concept where you're using one of the columns that is available in your data source. Uh, let's talk about operational DB where I have list of employees and I have a column called date timestamp or a unique ID. It could be an ID column itself, identity column. And so I'm going to use that ID column and then be able to extract the diffs and based on that diffs i'm going to insert that into the bronze uh, and i'll do some data engineering work over there so this is where i start with the lookup and this is the idea is to retrieve the last high watermark value stored in external control table and so here we are using a control table and the control table actually it's not external it's a data warehouse table that i'm using so if you look into the settings uh, it is a contest or dw table and i can absolutely open that one and show you what that control Control value it currently stores. So this is my EMP table and this is my watermark table. This is what I'm referring to. And right now it has a watermark value of 20. So think of watermark as what is the last record that you have copied. And in this case, it's the ID with value equal to 20, right? And so let's do now uh, some fun thing. Uh, let's see how this pipeline works and how it makes sure that it doesn't copy everything that this particular data source has. And for that, I'll have to pull up this um, uh, data studio because this data lives in the Azure world. Uh, so I will do some insertion into this database. So I'll insert two records here, which is, uh, you can see E3, uh, let's change this name to uh, maybe Mr. and Abhishek. We will insert these two employees here. And then what I would do is uh, run this quickly. 
and now what it does is it affects two records which means it inserted two values so if my last run was 20 this would now create a watermark or id column as 22 uh, that's expected and so now when i get back to my pipeline and i'm gonna give it a quick run and it takes only a few seconds and then i'll explain you what the stored procedure and this uh you know teams activity does And I have an option of overriding these parameters. This is also a very good fundamental that data engineers should follow is how to parameterize your notebooks, your pipelines, so that you can make it more and more generic. Think of it as creating more as libraries, which can be instantiated to any data sources that you want. And that is one critical part of data engineering process. So here I have created, just as an example, my table names, my watermark column, my destination container, where I want to store this data into my raw or bronze zone and then uh, what is the table name and the control table column name that I'm using which means if I want to reinstantiate this pipeline for a new table let's say sales table right it just takes me this screen and I can just update the value of the table name over here as sales I can update the watermark column it could be date timestamp right like sales date or something right and then similarly I can change the destination folder to sales right and this way I can have a very generic pipeline which does this work all the time across all tables and I can even build a metadata driven pipeline out of it even fun is I can create all the list of tables in my metadata table in in a database and then use a lookup to fetch that and then start this whole set of pipelines dynamic pipelines so i can have like you know instantiate 100 such table ingestion processes into bronze using a single pipeline by making parameter like an array or which i can use a lookup activity to extract that metadata from an excel sheet or csv or you know from a table uh, anywhere right uh, whichever works so this is the beauty of using pipelines and making it more and more generic and you can start you know adding more specifics into another set of pipelines and then stitch it all together via invoke pipeline so that's the typical thing so i'm going to use the default share click on okay and it's going to take a few seconds before it gets the pipeline to a run state and then you will be able to observe each of these executions in real time and you can see the pipeline status is in progress and i'm going to take a few more seconds before my lookups are done and i can see the output of these lookups you can see the new watermark value that it extracted was 22 as i said because we inserted two more records the previous lookup value if you see was 20 because we inserted two records so it became 22 now now the fun part is let's go through and see what the copy does now um, it's only two records so it shouldn't take much more time and so uh, it should be done by now and so if i click on it you can see that it actually read two rows and wrote two rows uh, which is good uh, and it finished all the other processes as well which is perfect uh, and it then updated the watermark because we need to update the watermark because i showed you earlier here our watermark value was 20 and if i just refresh this value i think this should be 22 now because we used a storage procedure let's hit the refresh button here and it's 22 so we were able to insert ingest and then insert it back here now let's quickly check on the data that we injected here um and uh what i want to show you here is the actual um destination that we set here it was a lake house bronze and you would see a lot of parameters being used expressions being used uh it may sound complex but it is not and i'll explain you in a bit uh this is basically an expression language that the pipeline uses and what it's doing is it's concatenating and it's creating a data set path where we'll store this data and to keep it more generic we would want to use parameters and expressions and so this is what it does it's it says that it's it's using the data set uh, data destination container remember it gave me five options to enter when i was running the pipeline it is using one of those parameters which is your destination container name this is how you can customize whether it should be emp or it should be a diff for a different table it might be a different folder that you want to in insert data into and then i'm saying let's create subfolders inside it so i'm doing a slash and then i'm using a date time logic because 
every time when I ingest data, I do want to keep a watermark over there, a uh, well partitioned data. It's again a very good in data engineering fundamental so that you don't overload your data lakes uh, and you have well partitioned path information because how the data lakes or, or the binary blobs work is basically they are well partitioned based on the, the structure, the name, the, the, the paths that you provide. And so <clears throat> what we are doing is I'm creating a function called, I mean, it's a function available in pipelines, UTC now, and I'm formatting that UTC now to look something like year, 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 slash month, month, slash DD. And these slashes will transform into folders inside my lake house. And I'll show you how, how it, it actually looks in a second. And then I'm also appending a pipeline run ID, which is specific to this specific run of a pipeline. As I said, idempotency is important. It is equally important to be able to find out who wrote the records uh, for, it's for admin and governance. For example, if you have, if you know there's a failure in a pipeline or there's something wrong in a pipeline, you can easily understand, find lineage of that, you know, data coming from that pipeline. So what we are doing is we are injecting here as an additional step, a run ID of the pipeline, and you can always find or search this run based on the run ID in the monitoring hub as well, right? So you can do a correlation back who created this file, this was the pipeline run, these were the parameters used, and so on. So it's absolutely important. Think of it as forensics in case if you need it, right? Uh, you can find exactly who generated it, what was the parameters used to generate this file and things like that and troubleshoot things in case if you get into data issues later on. So I'm doing that. So it's it's doing as, as much as that. Now let's go to the bronze, to the actual lake house and see how these folders turned out to be or these files turned out to be. So I'll go to my uh, bronze zone here and in the bronze zone what i'm doing is i'm actually writing into files and not tables and as i told you earlier the consideration of bronze is that we would uh, we would keep the data ingestion performant we would not change the format we would not change the schema uh, and we will keep it as raw as possible and that's what exactly i'm trying to do here by adding them into files right not into the tables because if i'm doing the tables i'm already committing it into a delta table uh, and then i'll have to maintain the delta table uh, i'll have to do compaction blah 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 all the kind of right practices that i should be doing but i don't want to be doing those in my bronze right and so in bronze i'm just going to copy data as is and this is what was dynamically created path using that expression which we just saw now is it creates something called employee it adds the year, beautiful, and and um, and then it adds the month, then it adds the day, and then you will see a few run IDs because I have done some runs before. This is where it is extremely critical for you to understand, even in the dev environment, that I have generated multiple runs and these have generated different files. The good part is we are only doing incrementals, as you saw, right, in a query. We are only doing the watermarking and we are running queries based on from last watermark to the current watermark and only extracting the diffs. So if you see that if I were to get the all of today's data, all I have to do is point to this folder uh, from a notebook and and do a star uh, out of this folder and then say read the files and it's going to read all the files across these folders and get me a data frame right that's how easy it is to work on it and we'll we'll get there in a bit but more importantly let's correlate the run ids that we were talking about um and you can easily find them in the pipelines that you run so the pipelines that we had over here uh, incremental data ingestion uh, we got a run id which starts with 6c3 and if you look into this um, we will have a similar id here um, in my bronze employee 23 12 29 and the bottom one here, 6C3. This is the one which just ingested and it should have the two records with uh, Estera um, and, and my name. And what it does inside it, it is, it, you can customize this name by the way in copy activity if you wish to, uh, but if you don't customize that name, what it does is it just gives you data underscore and it appends the run ID uh, of the copy activity, which is again, a useful thing because if you want to track back AE, 
eight. For example, let's say you had multiple copy activities inside a pipeline ingesting data from different partitions, right? You might want to know exactly which partition is it ingesting data from. So this is A8E. And if I go back to my pipeline, um, I would be able to kind of correlate it with uh, the particular copy activity that I ran here. Uh, and if you want to see the run ID of this copy activity, you can click on it. Um, and you will see the run ID here, A8E, right? Is the same ID. And so this is where forensics and stuff comes into picture that you can actually correlate between these files. It's fun uh, uh, if you want to, for me, it's fun. Uh, but then uh, coming back uh, to this view of bronze and actually validating the data inside it, uh, when you click on it, uh, it's, it's the format that we selected over there was um, uh, delimited text or CSV. And so it shows up in CSV format and you would see the same names that we injected uh, right in the first phase um, in through through our tool. Uh, and we can see exact those data ingestion. So this is how you do dynamic data ingestion. Why I keep word using the word dynamic is there are a lot of parameters being used in this pipeline. It fetched watermark values. And so it's dynamic in nature because it's only ingesting only the new records, right? Uh, it makes it dynamic. The second thing is the table names, the folder paths in bronze, everything is parameterized from the pipeline, right? Which means tomorrow or in five minutes, I can move this ingestion from this table to another table in my database or uh, another folder in my AD layers gen 2 and, and stuff like that. I don't have to recreate a pipeline again and again and again. I, I just have to uh, re-parameterize or rather uh, con con control the whole flow via a set of parameters. And that's the beauty of it. And these are my earlier loaded files. And that's a quick demo of how you would ingest data we haven't talked about scale yet, which I will talk about scale, but this is how you start ingesting data into your lake house bronze as is, as much as without transforming the data. The beauty you get is since you're not getting into schema conversions and things like that, you can extend this whole process across hundreds of tables uh, and you can load data from hundreds of tables. That was truly phenomenal. Abhishek, thank you so much. I'm sharing my huge impression as that is what we are going to talk about during the next episodes, how to build ETL ops, meaning that how to operationalize everything what we are doing within Microsoft Fabric. So could you please comment the case that we have uh, varying data types? We have a varying changing data volumes. And by having the pipelines, how we can be sure that the efficiency and reliability is there? Absolutely, that's a great question. So uh, I'll switch quickly to another pipeline that I have. And pipeline, if I go into the details, in the previous example, we ingested data from a database, but that's not what pipelines meant for. It can ingest data from various sources. It could be database. Uh, it could be a data lake as well. For example, I'm just gonna use my blob for a bit here and I can point it to a data set or a path. Um, and I'll show you uh, basically a good amount of data that I have uh, and I'll ingest that data. Um, and so if I use the COVID tracking data uh, right now, it must be in a few GBs. And what things we support over here is apart from different file formats, we do have something called binary. And the purpose of this binary is to keep performance on top of the bar like think of it as if you're not doing any schema alterations or type conversions things like that which kind of are part of transformations you must be able to ingest the data at scale uh, whatever that size is like whatever storage allows you or whatever one lake allows you let's say it allows 5 gb per second ingestion we should be able to get you that 5 gb per second ingestion um, by doing such kind of tweaks, which is changing the settings to binary. Uh, and when you do that settings to binary, uh, make sure you do the same thing in uh, um, Lakehouse as well. In Lakehouse, you can choose it to be files where you can actually make it uh, binary. You can give it a directory, make it binary over here. Uh, don't do any format conversions. And then you will see that mapping section is disabled, rightly so, because it's not looking into your schema. Uh, you don't need to do any mapping there. Uh, and that makes it much more performant 
especially scenarios where you're loading in or ingesting using pipelines into the bronze section, uh, right? Many times you cannot use it, especially when you're using tables. It's not binary because you have to understand the schema of the table and then read that files. Um, but then we have different performance scaling mechanisms there. We do have things like throughput optimizations where you can suggest uh, which mode you want to use. Maximum, uh, what, what these modes does is it kind of defines how much of compute are we allowed uh, as Microsoft to use to run your job. And if you say auto, we will, you know, try and figure out the best, uh, you know, f compute for you. But if you say standard balance to maximum, uh, you are specifying yourself what level of compute you want. And in, in the ADF world, we used to term this as data integration units, DIUs. Um, uh, but now we have kind of simplified this in three modes, standard, balanced, and, and maximum. And so standard gives you the minimum number of nodes. It gives you more cost efficiency and uh, balanced maintains balance between cost and performance. And maximum gives you the best performance. Like imagine you have to hit 5 GB per second. You know, in the back end, we may even have 256 nodes running to kind of ingest your data across your ADLS Gen 2 account into Lakehouse or S3 account into Lakehouse. And that's what's going to give us that capability of ingesting data with 5 GB per second or more uh, bandwidth uh, using a single copy job is when you choose this maximum, right? If you want to be cost conscious, um, and take the decision up front, you can make it up uh, standard, right? For example, you know that your records are not gonna be more than 100 or 1000 uh, in a single run. Uh, you can absolutely choose standard or you can use auto because our auto will never like push the limits when the data is not available. So the logic that we use here, and that's why we call it intelligent throughput optimization, is because we start running the job on a single node first, and then we analyze the metadata based on the size of your source data set. We then scale the nodes to you know, 10, 100, 200, whatever the need is. And so this scale is very dynamic, and you're not paying upfront for any of these, right? So if you choose auto, uh, we will never end up charging you for 10 nodes, 20 nodes, or V cores, uh, you know, unless your data actually permits us to do so. So that's why we call it intelligent, and that helps you with your cost as well. Now, there are a few other things. Uh, degree of parallelism. Think of this value as within a single node, how many parallel processes that we will run, right, to lo load your data. And this is extremely useful when you're doing, like, performance tuning and you're seeing that you're using the throughput as max yet you're getting only 1 gb per second performance or 2 gb per second performance how can i further raise it and that is where you will come to this property which is data uh, degree of copy parallelism which can help in some cases in many cases actually uh, improve or push up your performance because if you're doing binary copy uh, mostly doing it by a single thread is not very memory intensive so if you want to do it on seven or eight parallel ones on a single node it kind of makes better use of those machines and gets your performance up so this is where uh, you can again leave it to auto we will try and determine from our metadata parsing uh, what the best value is but if you're sure of your data sets and if you're a pro and you know exactly what to do what to expect you can give it a value and we will honor that value and then we'll make sure those many partitions are read in parallel and written in parallel and so that's what these two properties are extremely important for performance tuning and these two properties are also valid for some of the data sources like uh, databases as well which supports partitioning and then we have a few other properties which are again very useful especially when you're moving large data sets is consistency verifications these are values instead of we were talking about what are the values or what is the benefits of using pipelines right so when you're ingesting data even binary so you can actually mark this checkbox as consistency verification right and you can specify fault tolerance settings for example sometimes when you're accessing data from data lakes these files are not accessible or someone is reading those files at the same time or writing those files and so it is a common problem in data engineering world is not all the files that you're trying to access is readily accessible to you in in our pocs and demos yes everything works well because i'm doing that but in real world there are hundreds of people working on their data sets and so at times these are 
common issues and so you can make a call whether you want to skip these files you want to uh, skip only the forbidden files that you don't have access to or files with invalid names which will cause you further downstream problems because of the naming constructs that they have used so we have these things and if you have chosen a table or a tabular data like a database it would give you more options like skip that incompatible row option and so it's very very useful where if you find some row which is compatible with that data source let's say postgresql but it's not compatible with lake house tables right and so you want to capture those files uh, and not lose them right so you we give you an option of, in such cases is log those incompatible files into a different file itself so this gives you again an audit trail of those records which were faulty or which were not compatible with your destination and hence you don't lose them but you keep a log of those records uh, in some other place so you get all those beautiful fault tolerance features in pipelines which many people don't know of so i just want to talk about them this settings thing is does a lot of hard work in terms of doing those you can set up a different logging account as well you know where you would want to store these skipped files or skipped rows and things like that and then you have staging option for performance sometimes you know performance can be improved via staging and the reason is that the compute that you're using imagine that when pipelines are using on-premise data gateway which is running on a single node you may not be in a best place to be able to write parquet files directly right uh, if especially when you're not doing a binary copy when you're writing a parquet files it's because it can be memory intensive and it's a shared compute and so it's going to die if you if you overload it and so that is the cases where you would want to use this staging button on and what it does is it's going to copy data as fast as it can from that compute into a staging environment as binary and from there it's going to use the cloud compute or the cloud runtime to kind of do a partition load into your lake house and that will be much more performance so these are some of the performance and reliability options that I wanted to quickly run through that's huge as majority of those options are unknown as it's the last tab can you comment just a little about what is the compute under it absolutely uh and and that is the magic thing right so number one thing which i want to call out is it is truly serverless for customers uh the compute right in terms of billing in terms of experience it is there's nothing that customers have to provision here uh, you don't see any provisioning options. There's no latency. You saw how quickly the copy activity finished. It took 16 seconds, though it copied only two records. So I would argue that 16 seconds is too much for two records. But what we need to understand under the hood happening is it probably took 15.5 seconds in terms of getting the runtime, the compute ready. And then uh, it took, you know, 0.5 seconds or less uh, to kind of actually record uh, those rows and then report it back to the uh, reporting system so that it can show you in monitoring. So I think the, the cool part here is while we say it's serverless, uh, yes, we are making it serverless. We are having huge dedicated pools of compute running for customers. These are all the runtimes that we use. We don't disclose what runtime we use. And, and the reason for that is we want to keep it agnostic and transparent to customers so that it doesn't break your flows or pipelines uh, with, with versioning, for example, right? Like we don't want to break your pipelines because we are shipping a new version of a connector or new version of a runtime. And that's why we don't expose the details of the runtime. So that's why it is truly sassified already because you don't have to worry about the runtime. It is a lot of work on our engineering teams to make sure there's compatibility with 170 connectors. Uh, we don't break customers anytime. While we are doing security fixes, performance fixes all the time, all the time, all the day in the week, yet there is no promise of breaking these for customers. And hence, this is completely serverless because one of the requirements for serverless is it shouldn't be something that customer is provisioning. It should be available all the time. It should bill only for the execution duration. And these are all the things which is being followed here. And to get to more details, we do give you other ad additional options like bringing your own connectors via ODBC. And you may have guessed now the runtime is .NET based because ODBC drivers uh, works with dotnet and so you can extend to your data sources which are beyond these 170 sources using your own odbc connectors as well and uh, yes it's dotnet based runtimes but it runs on distributed compute so we have a distributed compute and it's all dedicated for customers it's very well isolated per run per customer 
uh, run actually. And so you get all the security features, yet it's serverless and you only pay for the durations of the job. So if you run for five seconds, you pay for five seconds. It's true, SaaS. I love it. And have to, you know, kind of a shoot into my leg as that's the difference when we are running some notebooks um, in the Spark runtime. Spark is bringing new versions every six months and we have to migrate. We as a user, we as a customers, we have to migrate. We have to change, adjust our notebooks, our code. And with this approach, it's a true SaaS. I truly love it. Absolutely. So, Do it once and forget it. Exactly, exactly. So let's wrap up that episode today and we'll continue the discussion about making our ETL repetitive. So we'll talk about operationalization of ETLs during the next episodes. Thank you for today. Uh, thank you for watching us. If you like this episode, for sure, I love it. Please leave the like button, subscribe, leave a comment, leave the suggestion. And until next time, please discover medallion architecture, the, the bronze, the silver, the gold layer, everything without Microsoft Fabric, touching data factory, touching lake house, so you can get the true design pattern implemented there. Thank you so much.